Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Jo Meissner. I'm Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs here at the Boston Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we are um, here having this roundtable discussion about uh, Chapter 40R, its past, present, future, and the importance of smart growth housing. Uh, to the Commonwealth. This is the 10th anniversary of Chapter 40R. Uh, it holds a special place in the hearts of us here at the Boston Foundation, and it's terrific that we've gotten this nice turnout of uh, folks to hear about where we are and where we want to go. Um, before I start that, many of you uh, in this room know, know who we are at the Boston Foundation, know about our work. But for the few of you who might not, um, I'm just going to do a little commercial. Uh, the Boston Foundation is Boston, Greater Boston's Community Foundation. We were established in 1915, um, and in that, we are one of uh, the nation's oldest and largest uh, community foundations. As you can tell, we are getting ready to celebrate our 100th anniversary next year. And we will, uh, we, we look forward to engaging, I hope, all of you in the various activities we have planned for our centennial. We serve as a major funder of regional nonprofit organizations. We work as a philanthropic partner. And in many ways, uh, we feel like we have become one of the primary civic conveners and leaders in Boston. And we do that through this program called Understanding Boston, which is a series of forums, educational events, and research sponsored by the foundation to provide insight into key issues affecting Boston, its neighborhood, and its regions. Um, this program is made possible in large part um, through donations to our Civic Leadership Fund and to the Permanent Fund uh, for Boston. And I want to offer a special thanks this morning to many of you in the room who have been um, annual contributors to this fund. We appreciate your support because it allows us to continue to do this and bring people together. So this is an exciting time for Boston and the region. We are seeing strong evidence of a real turnaround in the regional housing market. Mayor Walsh has convened a housing task force. I imagine several of you in the room are part of that and has charged them with having a housing plan by June that will chart a strategic response and operating plan to meet Boston's housing challenges, including increasing the supply of housing to meet our economic growth and increasing the supply of affordable housing. This is in addition to the Patrick administration's statewide goal of producing 10,000 multifamily units of housing per year in the Commonwealth. This increased attention to housing as a necessary component of our future economic growth is something for which many of you in this room have advocated for many years and which we all must continue to press forward. The Boston Foundation has been a major funder of housing and community development um, programs in the sector for decades. And I'm pleased that we're going to continue that work with renewed vigor following the recent arrival of Be Becky Kepnick as our Director of Neighborhoods and Housing. Becky brings just outstanding experience in the affordable housing industry in New York and in working for Secretary Sean Donovan in DC. And we are so excited to have her part of our team and I'd like her to stand up. In addition to our role as funders, the foundation has played an important research, convening, and advocacy role, as I think all of you know. In 2002, the Boston Foundation convened the Commonwealth Housing Task Force, which played a major role in the passage of the smart growth housing legislation that we're here to talk about, 40R, and the subsequent legislation, 40S. To date, the legislation has yielded the zoning of more than 12,000 housing units and smart growth districts across the state. Uh, and we are proud today to be partnering with the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Economic Development, Community Development, to bring you an update of the law and its impact throughout the Commonwealth. But we at the foundation are extremely proud of the, um, the role that we played in helping to create 40R. Um, through the work of the Housing Task Force, um, the Greater Boston Housing Report Card, which uh, Professor Barry Bluestone has done for us for 13 years in a row, and I think Barry's here. I just want to acknowledge Barry at the back there. Um, working with Ted Carmen, 
um, who really we think of as the architect of 40 Art, Ted is up here in the front row, and others to develop the concept and write the legislation. Uh, we are pleased to have three co-chairs of the Commonwealth Housing Task Force here with us this morning, Eleanor White, Jerry Rappaport Jr., and Larry DeCara. Uh, they join Robert Smythe, the former president of Citizens Bank Massachusetts, and continuing to help us bring these issues forward. Um, so this, this approach that we've taken of research, policy solutions, and advocacy from what we like to think of sometimes as unusual suspects, bringing people together across the board from the business and development community, as well as housing advocates, has been a successful recipe for major policy ac accomplishments. And I want to thank all of our partners in this. It's, it's been a pleasure to work with the, all of you over the years. So today we're here to celebrate this 10-year-old law, but to rededicate ourselves to making sure that our Commonwealth's doors are open to all, that we can continue to retain and recruit our best talent and house all of our citizens of all incomes. So with that, um, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from our distinguished panel, which Bob Fishman will introduce shortly and moderate. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over right now to my good friend, David Bigelfer, the CEO of NIOP, Massachusetts, the Com Commercial Real Estate Development Association, which is our co-sponsor for this event. Uh, here at the Boston Foundation, we have partnered uh, consistently over the years with David, and it's our pleasure that he's here with us this morning. Thank you. I'd like to take the next 40 minutes to go over the last 200 years of housing in Massachusetts, starting back, as you said, around, okay, maybe I won't go that road. Um, actually, I am here very much to, to say that I am a very much appreciative of all the collaboration that not only we have done with the Boston Foundation, but for them being really the, uh, the center for leadership in the city of Boston. They're not just deep pockets for, uh, for the various uh, uh, funding that they do, but they really are truly uh, a convener of leaders uh, in the Commonwealth and in Boston, and uh, I think they really have made a major impact. Uh, getting back to very, very briefly uh, regarding 40R and 40S, I mean, it's a great program, but it really shows what can happen uh, when people come together with seeing a pressing need come up with unique and creative ideas and band together and work to get something accomplished. Uh, it's rare that that happens in this Commonwealth. It really happens certainly in Washington. Um, but I think the 40R and the 40S program prove that where there is a will, there can be a solution. And I think we're at the starting point right now. Uh, it's great that we have the number of units that we produced, but clearly one of the biggest challenges in the Commonwealth is the problem of the middle income housing and there are very few programs out there that can really lead us to this. We've seen in Boston that it's very easy, or relatively easy these days, to produce the high in and end income uh, housing, but it is clearly necessary across the Commonwealth, you know, with 40B, with 40R, to be able to produce the kind of housing that keeps the young professionals uh, in this state, uh, which is the driving force, certainly, for our economy. So I think the job going forward, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it, is to get more communities, you know, to buy into the 40R, to get more developers to be aware of the program and see that it is a viable program and can really produce results. Uh, so with that, I really want to thank all of you to be here, for being here, and want to start off and uh, lead right into the program. Thank you very much. So now I'd uh, like to introduce Bill Railt, who is the principal planner of Smart Growth Programs at um, DHCD. Uh, Bill has worked on a variety of DHCD programs and initiatives, including urban renewal, CDBG, sustainable development, 40B, and the local initiative program. And he now administers the Commonwealth Smart Growth Zoning Program. He's going to walk us through, I think, a very interesting update on where we are with 40R. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Mary Jo, and thanks to the uh, Boston Foundation uh, for hosting this event and uh, NIOP for co-sponsoring. Um, I was uh, told to uh, begin my remarks or, uh, by, by making it clear that we have money. Um, <laughs> we have about uh, taking into consideration uh, pending uh, payments, we have about th uh, $3 million. Um, so we are open for business, and uh, 
Uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, discussion, um, we'll, we'll spur some more interest in uh, development both within existing 40R districts and uh, exploration of new districts. Um, so, uh, excuse me. It's been uh, 10 years since 40R was adopted, and I think it's fair to say that uh, um, over that period, consensus has only grown around the importance of smart growth, and I think that 40R uh, is, is a factor in that and has really uh, sort of um, uh, brought attention to the idea of smart growth and really uh, created a, a common understanding within the Commonwealth. Um, under Governor Patrick's uh, leadership, the um, transportation, environmental, and uh, housing and economic development agencies have worked together to develop a shared vision for growth uh, centered around three key goals um, with the governor's target for producing 10,000 multifamily units a year as uh, particularly relevant to today's discussion. Um, the other uh, goals being uh, re uh, relative to uh, mode share, mode shift, and reduction of greenhouse gases. Is, uh, just for a little context, um, the framework that EOHED has employed to help implement this vision and achieve these goals is the uh, Planning Ahead for Growth initiative that seeks to work with municipalities and other stakeholders to identify places for growth and preservation uh, where applicable, create prompt and predictable permitting, and invest in public infrastructure as necessary and then to market those opportunities. And I think 40R can be seen as sort of indicative of um, you know, the, the create, uh, the mechanism for uh, prompt and predictable permitting. Um, and, and today is hopefully uh, a partial effort anyway to, to try to help market some of these opportunities. I think most of you are familiar with the basic concept of 40R, so that's not what we're going to really talk about today or spend too much time on. But for those who aren't familiar in the room, I'm just going to briefly uh, describe it. 40R is a voluntary incentive program that offers municipalities direct and indirect financial benefits in exchange for adoption and implementation of zoning overlay districts that meet three basic criteria relative to location, as of right densities, allowable densities, and affordability. Um, so beginning with locations, we have uh, three types of eligible locations, near transit stations, uh, what's called a, an area of concentrated development, which is a city or town center or existing commercial district, and then a third category, highly suitable location, which are other areas that don't fall into one of the first two categories, but nevertheless uh, are, you know, are consistent with smart growth principles in terms of uh, the um, existing infrastructure and redevelopment opportunities. The as of right densities, um, uh, these are allowable densities, eight units an acre for single family, 12 units an acre for two and three family, and 20 units an acre for multifamily. The minimum affordability requirement is 20%. The financial benefits, um, consists first uh, of the zoning incentive payment, which is based on the net number of new units that the zoning allows over and above the existing as of right zoning. And the $3,000 uh, density bonus payment is for each unit that is permitted consistent with the smart growth zoning under 40R. Uh, and lastly, uh, um, Mary Jo mentioned 40S, which is the school cost reimbursement. Uh, and that is uh, to sort of an insurance plan to cover any net increase in school costs attributable to uh, <coughs> students moving into school-aged uh, children moving into the district. So uh, just a, a glimpse of the geography of, of the activity to date. Um, we have uh, 33 districts in 31 municipalities. Uh, those are, that are officially approved. In addition to that, um, we have three districts that are pending final approval. Uh, they are uh, Ludlow, which uh, we are just uh, uh, finishing up a review of their design standards, uh, and, and we expect to issue a letter of eligibility, I would say, uh, within the coming weeks. Um, 
there is a Swamp Scott and Norwood. Uh, um, Adam might uh, touch on Norwood uh, later on. Uh, that they are adopting their second district, the Guild Street district, and uh, we are waiting for their application for final approval. Uh, basically just verifying that what they adopted was, was what we initially approved as eligible. And then Swamp Scott um, adopted a district uh, mirroring uh, an existing district in Marblehead. Uh, they, you know, actually uh, adopt, went ahead and adopted it before submitting an application, so we're kind of, that's, that's going to be a little bit of a process, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we're pretty confident uh, because they modeled it after uh, Marblehead that uh, it'll be fine. Uh, in terms of, uh, this gives you an idea of these numbers up here are what the zoning allows in these, in these districts. Um, you can see there's, there's quite a range in terms of the size. Uh, Mary Jo mentioned uh, over 12,000 zoned units, uh, 2,186 of which have, are either uh, built or in construction. Uh, we have some uh, pending districts, uh, Ludlow I mentioned, Norwood, and uh, another one, uh, sorry, Ludlow, Norwood, and there's a second one in Norwood that failed at a town meeting recently, the Plimpton Press 40R proposal. Uh, nonetheless, it remains eligible for three years, and uh, we're hopeful that, that it might in the long run pass. Uh, I want to touch on just briefly um, the recent regulatory changes in November. Uh, a number of people in the room here today uh, were involved in helping to uh, craft those, those regulatory changes. Uh, the main idea here uh, was that, you know, the program had been, um, you know, as, as we've noted today, in, in existence for 10 years, and we've, we've gotten some experience over that period, and to try to uh, make, make the regulations a little more effective. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but ones of, of particular interest, perhaps, to this group, uh, we tweaked the definition of underutilized land. Uh, which was creating a little disincentive because uh, underutilized land, what is categorized in the district as underutilized land or developable land, contributes to the zoning incentive payment, that upfront payment. And uh, the way the regulation was written, uh, it really didn't, if something was still in use, no matter whether it was, you know, a parking lot, uh, there, was, there was not real clarity on whether we could, um, in fact, count that. Um, so it wasn't really what people think of as sort of, you know, is this property being used as high as highest and best use? Um, conditional approval. <laughs> this this was focused on um, communities where, uh, you know, they they have a you know what what would otherwise be a smart growth location, you know, in a village center, but they just don't have adequate infrastructure, and we wanted to create a mechanism for those communities to go ahead and adopt the zoning. Um, with the understanding that they wouldn't get the incentive payment until, you know, a developer would show up and, and they could, you know, uh, or whatever, by whatever means, they could demonstrate that they have the infrastructure. So I'm going to um, now sort of move into sort of a sampling of some of the districts, and I'm going to begin with uh, a sampling of uh, districts that are primarily uh, built out. Um, uh, and then I'll get into ones that have had completed projects as well as um, they have some remaining development opportunities and then finish with some districts that uh, have seen no activity to date um, and also represent development opportunities. So as far as the built out districts are concerned, this is uh, Chelsea, the uh, box district. I mean, I think this is really sort of a textbook smart growth. Uh, it's uh, very close to uh, Chelsea Center, um, walkable to, to a, a great bit of uh, commercial. Um, it's redevelopment of brownfields, and it's in fact uh, played a role in the location of the uh, Silver Line extension, which is uh, underway. Um, this is the uh, Reddings, one of Reddings, two districts. Uh, this is the Gateway District. Uh, which is, um, was an old office park, and uh, Ted and Bob can, can speak to this later on, as I, I think they were both involved in this. Um, uh, but uh, really sort of a, an underperforming or vacant office park, and uh, you know, I, I think it, uh, this is finished up. It's, it's um, 
a fabulous project, and I think that one of the uh, things I wanted to point out about Reading is that uh, they actually uh, were able to develop or subsequently apply for a site eligibility letter under Chapter 40B, and because Reading, in part because Reading had two districts that were, be impl were being implemented, uh, that, that site eligibility letter was uh, denied by Mass Housing. So uh, just to, one of the municipal benefits of, of 40R. Uh, this is Linfield, which Ted will, I'm sure, uh, talk about in, in greater detail. Um, I, uh, again, um, you know, some mixed use. This was, um, and by the way, I should step back and say that both of the uh, two previous uh, districts were somewhat project driven, um, as was this, um, but although I think Linfield really, um, this, this fit into a plan that they had and uh, with a serious economic development component to it. A uh, couple of smaller districts beginning with uh, Belmont. Uh, this is uh, residential infill. Uh, this was, uh, y you know, a situation where there was some uh, surplus land um, that was, you know, coming onto the market, um, but the town did sort of, or the community really, the neighborhood, uh, uh, sort of, you know, got out in front of it and, and helped to create this district, uh, which um, has turned out what, quite well. Uh, another small one in Norwood. Uh, this is a, a very similar, a, a, a church property uh, that um, became available. Good example of an area of concentrated development. And now sort of to uh, finish up, this one is not actually um, completely built out at this point, but um, for all intents and purposes, I think there's a, there's a master development plan with existing developers. Uh, great project, good example of a highly suitable location. This is the uh, Northampton State Hospital site. Uh, the 40R district only takes up a portion of the overall redevelopment. And uh, now getting into some of the uh, completed, uh, districts with completed projects, but also uh, with remaining development opportunities. Uh, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but this is one of my favorites. Um, it's uh, Redding's uh, downtown district, uh, takes up, you know, occupies a substantial portion of their downtown, and it was really a, a sort of a municipally driven uh, district that, um, you know, there was, a, there was an effort to try to sort of a recognition that by bringing more housing into the downtown, they could help revitalize it. Um, uh, Oak Tree Development is here today, and they uh, built the first project in the district, the uh, 30 Haven Street development, which is just uh, um, really uh, classic sort of sustainable development, uh, vertical mixed use, steps from the commuter rail station, uh, green building standards, uh, just an exemplary project. And Pittsfield, um, this was another municipally driven 40R began quite ambitious, this, this uh, outline here that you see, the, the, the broader outline was the initially proposed district. They ended up dropping um, those areas out and just going with the, the individual sub-districts that were sort of the targeted developable areas. Um, two projects completed, Silk Mill and um, the uh, Amsterdam Apartments. Haverhill, another uh, sort of uh, larger mixed-use district uh, where two projects have been completed. I think Lisa will be talking about uh, uh, their, her project, uh, and, and, um, and there was another project completed by Forest City. Um, there are also remaining development opportunities in Haverhill, including the Chen Building and another property, and, and I should say that I have um, marketing material on those opportunities. If there are developers that are interested in this, I can, I can get those to you. Um, large district with, uh, you know, the developable area anyway substantially built out. Um, but the zoning does apply to the broader area, uh, so there, there are even more opportunities than are really <laughs> articulated by that number. And I should add that these numbers on these slides are the number of allowable units in the district. They don't reflect the, the actual project size. That 
is on the uh, chart that was on your tape, uh, your chair. Uh, if you look in the far right-hand column, you'll see the number of units that have been built in the district. And it may be one project, it may be a couple of projects. Uh, this is Brockton, uh, another uh, you know, broad uh, district that include, included a significant portion of the downtown. Uh, there are, uh, one very small project has been completed as well as a, uh, a larger project of station lofts. Um, there is a third project that's in the works and that Matt Zoller, I think, is going to talk about um, by Trinity, and that's uh, these two renderings here. Uh, Station Lofts is the uh, uh, completed pro one of the two completed projects. Um, there, just a general, um, you know, sort of comment on the on the types of districts overall and the patterns. Um, this is an example of a, a district in a gateway community. Uh, I would say that we've had strong participation from gateway communities, and um, that they are probably perhaps a little disproportionately represented in the in the overall uh, uh, distribution of 40R projects. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we, we think this is, uh, this is great. And uh, East Hampton is another um, municipal, municipally driven 40R. Um, there was a fair amount of you know, planning that it went into. This depicts uh, some of the existing conditions here on the right and with some of the um, ideas that they had for sort of filling out the, uh, filling in the missing teeth, so to speak, on the streetscape. Uh, on the left there is an image of a 50-unit uh, uh, project that is in, uh, that building permits have been issued for and is in construction. That's the Cottage Square project by uh, Arch Street, I believe. Um, there are, I, I, I have another uh, flyer on this, uh, this district as well for a property that's available. Uh, the last uh, three that I've covered here, um, uh, East Hampton, Brockton, and Haverhill all benefited as well from um, investments by, uh, by the administration uh, as far as uh, mass works and, and, other, and other resources, uh, which is something that uh, I should note is in the statute that uh, 40R uh, should, you know, makes communities, gives them a preference for state discretionary funds. And, uh, and we've really seen that uh, in a number of cases. Uh, this is North Andover. Uh, it is, we're sort of moving into the uh, districts where there's been no activity to date, uh, but nonetheless some, some uh, large opportunities. Uh, North Andover is a, is a stronger market. Um, there's a large site there with existing commercial and office. And uh, over on the right here, you can see the plan for the residential. Uh, this is another one where I have a flyer and some, some information from the property owner. It's also one where um, I think that the, the landowner um, uh, is, is uh, perhaps open to a partnership or, or, or an outright sale. Plymouth, uh, Cordage Park. Uh, another sort of, uh, you know, textbook smart growth here with, uh, you know, a, a, an old, uh, a mostly vacant uh, mill complex uh, adjacent to a train station and uh, mixed-use zoning, uh, considerable opportunity at 675 units. Uh, this is another one where I think that the, the existing property owner uh, might be open to, to a partnership. And Marblehead, uh, going to a sort of a smaller scale district, um, Marblehead had two districts. Uh, this is the Vinnan Square district, which is uh, adjacent to, which is on the, uh, the town line with Swampscott and Salem. Uh, Swampscott, I mentioned, has recently adopted a district that sort of mirrors this. Uh, essentially, uh, the 40R district uh, in Marblehead is, is this half of the triangle and the Swampscott uh, is that half of the triangle. So we're hoping that that uh, um, might encourage some, some opportunities there. And uh, Bridgewater, uh, Waterford Village. This was an existing uh, apartment complex. Uh, it's got some, some surplus land uh, in this area uh, that's available uh, or could be available. I think, again, this is an example where there's a, uh, you know, a, a, 
a property owner that um, might might choose to develop themselves or perhaps be open to a partnership. Uh, significant opportunity at uh, 594 units. Uh, it is mixed use. It does include some mixed use zoning along the street frontage, and it is uh, very close to uh, the MBTA station uh, as well as Bridgewater State College. Uh, and just to finish up, um, we want to be a partner and help in any way we can in both, uh, um, you know, advancing development within existing districts and also generating new districts. Uh, and uh, some of the resources that we can offer, the Priority Development Fund, uh, which is sort of winding down, but there we it does there is hundred thousand dollars remaining there. Um, that's going to be replaced by the PATH program, planning assistance for uh, toward housing. Um, very very similar program, um, uh, perhaps a little more uh, emphasis on just just multifamily housing in general, um, and but but really uh, just a, a recapitalization and. Uh, uh, we're going to have $600,000 available for that beginning in July. Will be uh, that's the target date for um, accepting applications for that. Um, there are other resources as well through some of our, our partners. Uh, MAPC has the uh, district local technical assistance. Um, so uh, encourage you to reach out if you've got some ideas, and uh, we'll try to help you find the, the, the resources to do some of the upfront planning. And uh, that's my contact information. And uh, my colleague in uh, 40R, Elaine Vanya, is here today as well. And she's um, equally equipped to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Representative Kevin Honan to give her remarks before then we turn it over to our panel. Uh, Representative Honan was first elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1997, representing the 17th Suffolk District. He has been the House Chairman of the Joint Committee on Housing for 11 years, since 2003, where he has been a champion for affordable housing in the Commonwealth, um, and someone that all of us have known well during that time and go to all the time. Among his many honors, uh, Representative Honan received the 2014 CHAPA Housing Heroes Award, the 2011 One Family Inc. Champion for Change Award, the 20, 2009 NIRO ne National Legislator of the Year Award, and that was the fourth Legislator of the Year Award that Kevin has received. Um, he graduated from Boston College in 1981, received a master's degree in management science from Leslie in 1991, and in 1999 he received his master's of public policy management from Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And that's his formal bio, uh, but to those of us who have worked to create, uh, develop, and implement 40R, he's our hero. Um, without him and his then um, Senate uh, co-chair in the Housing Committee, Senator Harriet Chandler, 40 Hour might not now exist, and to him we owe great debt. Representative Honan. Thank you, Mary Jo. Wonderful introduction, I may say so myself. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, good morning. Um, it was uh, a difficult time 10 years ago when uh, Harriet Chandler from Worcester and I were named chairs of the Housing Committee. It was during the fights over 40B, which are always still around, but back then it was particularly difficult. Uh, the pressure on the committee to, to, as it pertained to housing, was primarily a delegation of representatives fighting 40B. And we went around the state to 25 different municipalities and met with town planners who were afraid to plan. Uh, we were met by townspeople who were really afraid of dense development and were 
making it clear. I think, uh, is Angus Jennings here? Ang Angus was the town planner in Marshfield, and he, he will remember. We felt bad for Angus because we knew, he, <laughs> we, we, knew, we knew Angus wanted a plan, but he wasn't going to be able to plan in Marshfield. And I think in Marshfield there was an effort to preserve the turtles, right? Honorable, the turtles are like 70 years old. And then in other communities we went to, the effort was to preserve uh, beautiful trees, meritorious efforts, but yet they were, they were holding up a lot of uh, development. So to that end, uh, when Ted, Barry, and Elena came in with this wonderful plan, we were very excited about it, and we as a committee embraced it. It was uh, very important to our housing committee to have pressure put on us and put on the legislature to do more housing development and smarter housing development. I say that because, again, there's an incredible amount of, of uh, pressure in the legislature to fund education, transportation, health care. Health care was very big at the time, as it always is. So we were just delighted to have this extraordinary group in your chairs, Jerry Rappaport, Tom Hollister, and Larry DeCara, who were wonderful, and Paul Grogan and Mary Jo, and so many others whose names you'll hear about today. So they came up with this wonderful idea because clearly we in Massachusetts were desperate, as we still are today, for more housing development. Our, our, our resource here is our people. And when I talked, I represent Alston Brighton, so I deal with the, the, hospital, pre the, the hospital president of St. Elizabeth's, and we also have a BU, BC, Harvard, and you hear Eds and Meds, and we are desperate in that we need affordable housing. And quite frankly, the situation is as is, is tough today as it was 10 years ago. And this 40-hour program brings civility to development. In every community in Massachusetts when there's a town meeting, and I meet with labor people all the time, and I say, tell your members to show up to the meetings and support housing. Because even when you meet with some people in the labor unions, they're even concerned about 40 Bs and dense development. So this is an issue where it needs to be done in a smart, civil way. And that, quite frankly, is what I believe 40R brings to the table. And also, it's followed up by 40S to help with the school children because school costs, because you always heard back 10 years ago that we cannot simply afford additional school children in our district, which was disheartening to many people who were trying to build it because they felt that children were being treated as, as, as if they were toxic. So to that end, anyway, I'm just excited to be here because this isn't just an anniversary. This is a celebration. This is a wonderful law, and Ted, Barry, and Elena, uh, I thank you personally. It was just great working with you. Uh, just a very positive, positive effort because we were dealing back then with some very angry people on 40B, and we needed to do something positive, and you folks brought this wonderful idea up. So thank you for having me here this morning. That was wonderful, Representative. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to the meat of our program. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Bob Fishman. Bob is a senior partner in the real estate and finance uh, department and chairs the land use and development practice group at Nutter, McLennan and Fish. His practice focuses on development, financing, acquisition and disposition, leasing and land use environmental permitting. He does the whole nine yards. He was counsel to national development in connection with the 40 hour zoning process in both Linfield and Reading. He presently is an adjunct professor at Suffolk Law School, where he teaches advanced real estate transactions and graduated from Harvard College and from Harvard Law School. We're delighted to have him as our moderator. Come on up, Bob. There have been no dress rehearsals of this, so. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Should we have an interesting discussion? We have a great cross-section 
of folks who have had different experiences with 40R from both the municipal perspective and the landowner developer perspective. And I know you have each of their bios on your chairs, so I am not going to spend a lot of time going through that since you're here today to listen to the discussion and uh, hopefully take away some things you can use in your individual businesses. Um, I can't see from where I am who's, who's where, but Lisa, see where Lisa, Lisa heads the uh, planning office for the Ur Office of Urban Affairs at the Archdiocese and is going to speak about the Haverhill project that uh, Bill mentioned. Adam Costa works at Blattman, Bobrowski, and Mead and works often on these issues from a municipal perspective but has also done them from a developer perspective. And his bio uh, is on your chairs. Ted Tai at National Development. Ted is the managing partner. I have worked with Ted for many, many years. And uh, he will speak to two of the projects uh, in, that we've even done with 40R. National does all asset classes, and it's interesting that they used 40R in these two particular projects. And finally, Matt Zala from Trinity Financial, uh, project manager, and will speak to the Brockton project in particular that they've worked on that were in Bill's slides. Uh, Trinity does a great deal of excellent work in the affordable housing space. Uh, I, know, I am familiar with several of their other projects, so we're delighted to have each of the panelists with us. So the way we're going to divide our time, <clears throat> we're going to go for about uh, just under an hour. And for the first half of it, I've asked each of the panelists to take five to seven minutes to talk about their experiences with 40R, and a particular one or more projects they have worked on, and in the course of their, their discussion, uh, try to focus on two questions that I've asked them to consider. One is, what have been the positives of this project, uh, program, pardon me, from the municipal perspective? Uh, what has been the role of local leadership in the adoption of 40R? And what lessons have been learned from the municipal perspective in 10 years of this program? And then to flip it around, basically ask those same questions from the developer landowner perspective. Um, so, and then we'll do uh, some questions I've uh, other develop, also developed for the panel, and then we will allow about 15, hopefully <coughs> more, 15, 20 minutes at the end for your questions, so this can be more interactive, and I will give you the uh, two-minute warning to be thinking about your questions. You should think about them now, but I'll give you a two-minute warning that will go to the audience for questions. There will be a mic, so hold your questions until the mic is brought over to you. So, uh, Lisa, why don't we start with you? Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with 40R and yeah, your sure. projects up in Haverhill? Um, thank you so much, Bob. And first, I'd just like to say thanks to DHCD and to the Commonwealth Housing Task Force, uh, the Boston Foundation, uh, CHAPA, and, of course, uh, Representative Honan. More than anything, it, it's absolutely true. Everything Mary Jo said about him is true. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for your leadership. So I really greatly appreciate that. Thank you. So the Planning Office for Urban Affairs, our experience in Chapter 40R has been in Haverhill, where we developed the Hayes um, at Railroad Square. And I have to say, our experience was extremely positive, I think both for the developer and for the city. Um, it is one of the most productive development efforts we have ever been involved with, and I really think that Chapter 40R had an, an enormous amount to do with that. Um, the process is predictable. The standards and guidelines are cl were clear in our case. The approval process was uh, timely and it was extremely expeditious. That, of course, meant for, I think, both, again, the developer and the city, far less risk. In development, that is huge. Um, and also, because it was such a timely process, and we all know that in this business, time equals money, um, it meant that we all saved cost as well. So it was a huge advantage. Uh, we've done a lot of 40B development, and I have to say that this was a much more collaborative process, as, uh, as the chairman said. So um, I'm going to talk a, just a little bit about our development, but much more about the district, because I think that's what we're here for today. The Hayes is a 57-unit um, uh, historic rehab of a former mill building. It's, it's, actually, it's a very key component of the, downtown, the revitalization of downtown Haverhill. It's across from a commuter rail, and, and uh, just down the street from the commuter rail, and right across the street from a municipal garage that was built in part with our help because we were able to uh, get site control over some of the property the city needed to build that garage. Again, it's 57 units, it's mixed income, started off as rental home ownership, the market fell, we converted to rental to take advantage of the historic tax credit on the whole thing. So now what we have is, um, I think it's 23 tax credit units, 24 mods and markets, 
they can be converted to home ownership after the five year you know, wait period on the historic tax credit. So that's sort of how the development itself was structured. Um, but really to speak more about the process, we, we do consider this a, I guess I would say a sort of true 40R. This is one of the ones that was planned, bef not around a project, but really by the city and their planning effort. Um, there was great leadership and vision. It was a very deliberative process. Um, it, it, and it helped us, I think that 40R was developed in about six months. We, the city, helped us identify property. Um, we identified vacant property, signed to PNS. Um, within four months, the district was established pretty quickly. We got our zoning approvals in one night. And I'd like to say for people who know us in Brookline, where, <laughs> where, where it was five years, um, you know, five years, one night, there's a big difference. So. It, it's a, there's a huge advantage here. Um, and in addition to that, of course, people know that if, you, if the project is appealed, then there is a bond that needs to be posted. So there's a very, there's a very different bar that um, abutters or peelers need to meet, um, and that makes for a much smoother process. Very coordinated department reviews from the city, very expedited public review process, um, and again, time equals money. For the city, and I don't know how many municipalities are here today, but for the city, there were great Tr you know, tremendous benefits. The message in my um, conversation, at least, is going to be create more districts um, to the cities and build more um, in the existing districts to the developers. Honestly, there's a huge amount of opportunity out there for developers that I'm not sure they're aware of. For the city, again, it helped them revitalize their downtown um, in their central business district. Um, they got, one of their objectives was to develop the first floor retail space, so that's a requirement. Um, and they got that from, from through this process. It enabled them to preserve and rehabilitate the old mill buildings, reinvigorate the streetscape. So they really um, got a lot accomplished in what they were trying to do, you know, to, to create their vision or to follow on with their vision. The bound, is, my, is the 40, it's not up here, this one, right? Ours is the yellow district on your chair. Um, I, you know, there was a slide on it at one point, right? Um, what's interesting <laughs> about this is that track. I want to talk a little bit about how it was put together. They, the city started with a focus on Washington Street, the main street. They then extended that to the, some underutilized buildings and then to the waterfront to try to create design standards for the riverfront. Again, very deliberative, um, very thoughtful. Uh, the people involved in this, it was, it was quite a crowd, really. It was the mayor's office and the city departments, um, the Chamber of Commerce, the Haverhill Downtown Association, the Foundation, the Merrimack, the Merrimack Valley Regional Transit Authority, and Planning Commission. So again, very collaborative. Um, we are the blue building in the center of this. And one of the things I want to mention is that this has been so successful that it has led to um, Haverhill really developing their 43D uh, program. And also, they've just created two additional overlay districts, one of which, you can't really see this here, but so here's the river. And one of, one of which extends um, down in this direction to, uh, again, pick up more of those river parcels. We've just uh, gone out with a local partner. and We've actually purchased a lot of the um, property right along in that new district, the MS Grad, these creative district names. Um, and so we're, we're, we're putting together a very significant and major development um, that is really building on this 40R uh, that was first the one first established. Uh, one, a couple of last words on the benefits to the city. I know we're supposed to keep our comments brief. They got this, the maximum $600,000 payment for establishing the district. They will have help with you know, future costs. Again, it was a catalyst for their downtown development. It helped continue on um, some early projects and provided, again, this uh, very thoughtful process for the, for the city. Um, the one other comment I'd make on the developer advantage is when there's a 40 r district developed, when we build there, that we have confidence that other investment will follow. So we're not out there on our own. You know, I think that's a huge thing. You know that when you invest there, especially in an area like like, like Haverhill and Gateway City, a disinvested area, you know, you, there's an opportunity and an incentive for others to come in as well. Um, uh, there again, were about four, 500 units built in this particular 40R. It led to 43D. It led to more zoning, and I think it's been a huge success for the city and a great opportunity for developers. So I would encourage everyone to do more of it. Yeah. That's great. So Lisa, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. the impetus for the adoption of that district, I mean, who were the actual local leaders? Was there someone in the planning office? Was it the mayor, him or herself? Because in our experience, there needs to be 
one or more real right. drivers at the municipal level. Yeah, it really, I'd say it was the mayor. It was the director. They have a very strong director of planning. Uh, mayor Fiorentini is very, um, very pro-development. It is unusual because it's a, they welcome development in Haverhill. They know that they've got to deal with their downtown and they need to revitalize the area, so they really do welcome development, which I know isn't the experience in all municipalities, but it was the mayor. It was uh, Bill Pillsbury, the director of planning, the local um, Haverhill Foundation, who is our partner now in our next deal there. I think those were the key players, but the Merrimack Valley folks got involved uh, as well. So it truly was a, this is a great opportunity the state has given us. Um, let's take, let's take, you know, take a step back, look at in a thoughtful way what the boundaries want to be and involve uh, a lot of stakeholders. Terrific, thank you. So Adam, why don't we go to, yes, we'll just go alphabetically, I think. So Adam uh, is a practicing attorney and as I said earlier, advises many municipalities uh, on the adoption of 40R. So I'm not sure exactly which perspective you want to take because you've also done developer work, but why don't you maybe first speak from the municipal perspective and give some examples of that, uh, that work you've done. Thank you, Bob, uh, and thank you to the Boston Foundation for uh, sponsoring and hosting today's event uh, and for asking me to be a part of it. My firm, Blatman, Bobrowski, and Mead, has worked on about a dozen different 40R proposals uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And in large part, we've represented municipalities, although, as was suggested on a few occasions, we've also represented uh, private developers on developer-driven projects. Uh, as I thought about my remarks today, surely I couldn't uh, give you all an overview of 12 different projects. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is try to offer the municipal perspective, given that the majority of the projects on which we've worked uh, have been on behalf of municipalities. Uh, so I thought to myself, uh, why 40R? How is 40R different from and maybe even a preferred option to Chapter 40B development? And how can municipalities use Chapter 40R to their advantage? And so I, as I thought through the projects that we've worked on over the years, uh, beginning back in, in 2005, I think was the first project we undertook, uh, a few themes seemed to emerge in my mind. The first was uh, an important aspect to Chapter 40R is the public process, the uh, deliberation that occurs that maybe does not occur, often does not occur, with a 40B development. And the consequences of that deliberation, it's required under the, the Chapter 40R process that there initially be a public hearing, typically a selectman's public hearing, and in, in cities, a city council public hearing. That gives an early opportunity for uh, those with an interest in the development of the area being slated for redevelopment or for new development to make their opinions known. But that's not their only opportunity. There are multiple other opportunities through the process. There's a planning board public hearing, as there would be uh, with any new zoning adoption. And then ultimately, there's an opportunity for uh, opinions to be expressed either at the, the city council vote on the new zoning or at town meeting. And so we've seen on the various projects we've worked on, uh, those projects take different shape as the, pro as the, the process progresses. And so uh, a few examples in, in Easton, the Quesit Commons Smart Growth Overlay District, again, we represented the town. Uh, there was a negotiation that occurred during the public process and a discussion about the different types of uses that would be appropriate for the individual subzones or subdistricts that were created as part of that smart growth overlay district. Uh, similarly, uh, in, in Norwood, a recent project we undertook, probably one of the more recent projects that's been approved by DHCD, uh, there was a discussion about the appropriate density. This was a project that was a redevelopment of an existing printing press, uh, the Regal Press. And as part of the negotiation that occurred at the local level, the density was reduced from what was originally proposed because concerns were raised about the original density. And so, again, uh, providing for that opportunity for public input is something that uh, at least uh, residents don't feel they often get with a 40B development. Uh, similarly, location is probably one of the most important aspects to a 40R development. Uh, Bill Rayalt in his presentation described the different types of locations that are appropriate for 40R development. You've got the general highly suitable location category, but you've also got categories of uh, those sites that are in close proximity to public transit and those areas that are uh, areas of concentrated development, whether they're commercial areas or existing city or, or town centers or, or villages. Um, Again, the location-specific nature of Chapter 40R can be contrasted with 40B, where it's the developer that chooses the site, and the munis municipality and ultimately the Zoning Board of Appeals is put in a more of a reactive position than a proactive position. Uh, and so by municipalities adopting 40R districts and choosing the sites where those districts are appropriate, uh, getting approval from DHCD, the municipality has more control. Uh, again, some of the communities we represented, uh, Dartmouth was an example of an existing or a, a, a site that was 
currently available for development that had been a, a former uh, amusement park, the Lincoln Park. Uh, the former state hospital in Northampton is another good example of a redevelopment of a site that had fallen into disuse. Um, in, in Haverhill and in Pittsfield, you just heard uh, a little bit of information about the Haverhill project. Uh, Pittsfield was quite similar. Uh, they chose a variety of different subzones within their downtown areas that were slated for future redevelopment. Um, one other aspect uh, that, that uh, sort of fits in with this concept of municipal control, uh, an aspect of 40R versus 40B, is the concept of design standards. Uh, design standards don't exist when it comes to 40B development. The uh, developer proposes a project. Uh, again, the ZBA is in a position where they have to evaluate that project on its merits. And as we all know, if the ZBA denies the project, well, it's a tough fight at the Housing Appeals Committee. Uh, with 40R development, the municipality has the ability through the zoning process to adopt design standards. And there are different approaches to design standards. There can be mandatory objective standards that are uh, required to be followed by uh, proposed uh, projects and, and proponents of those projects. And there are uh, guidance uh, standards that, that are more uh, recommendations to a potential developer than they are uh, requirements. And we've, we've taken both approaches in the communities we represented. Uh, Pittsfield took an approach where they offered guidance through the design standards. Um, but other communities that we've represented, Sharon Commons, for example, uh, which was a, a, a 40 r district that consisted of two separate subzones, uh, mostly residential use, uh, they took a, a, a different approach. Their design standards were required, they needed to be satisfied, again, with a waiver provision that exists in 40 r that doesn't exist generally under Chapter 40A uh, in municipal zoning bylaws and ordinances. So the general rule, if you want to seek a waiver from a requirement in a zoning bylaw, is that you need a variance, and the variance standard is statutory and it's very difficult to satisfy. Under 40R, the HCD has approved of a variety of different waiver provisions um, that are quite flexible. And they give the approving authority, the plan approval authority, as it's often called, the ability through the review process to waive those standards if it would be in the interest of uh, creating affordable housing in the interest of um, arriving at the, the prescribed densities under Chapter 40R. Uh, the last thing I want to comment on is um, the financial incentives. And uh, municipalities often say to me, well, we don't, we don't want to uh, bargain away our, our zoning control or our zoning power. And so I, I'm not suggesting um, to, to anybody in attendance today, and I wouldn't suggest to any of the various municipalities that we represent, that uh, 40R should be chosen as a tool simply in exchange for the financial incentives. Um, but certainly because of all the other benefits of 40R, the financial incentives are sort of icing on the cake. And you already heard what um, Haverhill w was able to accomplish um, by way of uh, a, a payment to the, to the city in exchange for adopting a 40R district. And many of the other communities which we represented have really reaped the financial benefits of, of Chapter 40R, both initially with that uh, zoning incentive payment that comes when you adopt the zoning, and then subsequently as projects are proposed, as building permits are issued, there's an additional $3,000 per incentive unit, meaning the number of units above what could have been built there as of right that is paid to the municipality. So we've had communities that have uh, reaped rewards ranging anywhere from uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to upwards of one, even close to $2 million. So that's certainly an advantage to the municipalities that we've represented as well. Thank you. Sure, that's great. Thank you very much, Adam. So uh, before I turn to Ted Tai, uh, to illustrate Ted's uh, breadth of experience, I know that on Wednesday morning he spoke at a NIAR program on senior housing and, and the baby boomers and their housing needs. So he's the uh, consummate real, uh, real estate uh, professional in terms of different asset classes. So Ted, uh, why don't you talk about the experiences in both Linfield and the Reading Gateway project? Actually, Bob, I was speaking until late last night at Fenway Park with a group of out-of-town investors <laughs> I see. who had never been to Boston, so pardon me if my voice is failing <laughs> a little bit today. Um, it's, great, it's great to be here. You know, as a, as a developer, um, we, we, we really carry around a bag of tools, and uh, you know, our tools are used in different ways in different communities as we envision different projects. And, you know, we've had 40A, we, we use 40B, and um, very early on we were, with NAOPS uh, uh, being a big part of it, a supporter of, of 40R as a way to um, really be another tool with, uh, with some distinct goals. And so we, we uh, provided, uh, we utilized 40R in two different communities, in Linfield and in Reading, for two rather large projects. I'm going to 
focus today a little bit more on the Linfield project, which is the larger and perhaps the more interesting of the two. Um, so just to, to set the background of that project, uh, you've got a small community with very little uh, government infrastructure, not even a town planner, uh, with a desire, like many communities, to manage its affordable housing going forward, and frankly, to, uh, to limit its vulnerability to unwanted 40Bs, so to be proactive, uh, to try to create some economic um, vitality in the community. And the parcel that we controlled was a 200 plus acre golf course, basically a failing golf course, uh, with some economic, with some uh, environmental um, sensitivity to, towards it. And uh, you know, Lisa talked about real 40R. Well, maybe we were the unreal 40R. But I think, and I go back to what Representative Honan said, it, you know, it's, it, it, 40R is great because it creates structure. And 40R is great because it allows the realization of a number of different goals. And, uh, you know, Jerry was joking behind me there about uh, how far was my transit stop, and I think I said maybe, maybe in Malden. Um, but what we did was something different, which was we created an economic engine for the community. Um, we did it with the creation of affordable housing as a component to it. And while that town center, that walkability wasn't there, it really wasn't, um, we created it as part of this project. So really, if not for 40R, which had all those great benefits of creating housing and affordable housing, um, we would not have realized the, the, the fuller goal of the community of creating economic development. So for a property that by right would have allowed 56 single family homes that would have been the buy right use. Um, we developed a project and created a 40R district with actually several sub-districts that um, allowed for 180 uh, residential units, uh, about 400,000 square feet of retail development, and 80,000 square feet of office development. In addition to that, uh, we created a senior housing district that allowed for the creation of uh, 48 affordable senior units. And just to add a little more, uh, we created a nine hole municipal golf course that the community operates and when it reopens next year, we'll throw off uh, probably three to $400,000 a year to the community. So that, all of that would not have happened. I can tell you it would not have happened in a normal rezoning process. It happened only because of 40R. And uh, it, it would, there are a lot of people in the room who are involved in this, from Bob to Ted Carmen and Victoria McGuire and the, the aforementioned Angus Jennings and, and, and many others who, uh, who contributed to that process. Why did the process work well? Um, you know, it starts out with, uh, with setting goals and, and trying to find some consistency in goals with the community. Um, it helps in a small community when um, experts are brought in on behalf of the community. So there's a, uh, there's a well-organized and structured uh, process related to uh, uh, creating both the zoning itself, the resultant development agreement that uh, will come out of it, and the design standards. In, uh, in the case of, uh, of Linfield, um, the town was very clear in terms of what they wanted and what they didn't want. Uh, and that uh, came out very clearly in the zoning and it came out very clearly in a development agreement that was created around it. Um, we ended up with an 85 page design standard manual. Um, and I think you know, that we can talk about that later. There certainly are some lessons in that because uh, projects get developed over time, times change, and uh, the need for flexibility uh, going forward is really important. We did our initial uh, 40-hour uh, vote at town meeting in 2007. Uh, we have the project substantially open at this point, but we're building a second phase. And things change, they do change. Econo economic cycles change, uh, retailer needs change, housing needs change. So. Building in flexibility, I think, is one of the important lessons, uh, and we continue to have discussions about that with the town as, as we go forward. Um, so 
It's uh, 40R just, and I'm, I'm going to be brief, but you know, really it creates a great structure for talking about complex issues and complex projects, and it creates great incentives. The financial portion of it, clearly, to the town is very important, and um, and and something that was uh, was a key driver. But the uh, really, 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 the structure, the process uh, of 40R uh, is what resulted in uh, a real win-win for the community, for the developer, um, and that's an ultimately a great project, and that's what it's all about. Ted, before we move on, just uh, yeah. I asked Lisa this question earlier. So that was a, Haverhill was municipally driven. This one, the, the impetus sort of came from the developer side. Do you want to say something about how the town formed their working group to, um, th I'm thinking of some of the people from economic development and the selectmen and the town administrator to, yeah, to, to, it, to, to, you to know, engage it, with you? It never, it, you know, it's something like this can't happen without leadership. And uh, ultimately, you know, we're in Massachusetts. It's, we're a different animal than any place else. We have 351 cities and towns, and many of them end up at a town meeting. And uh, uh, we had the largest town meeting in the history of Linfield, and we wouldn't have gotten there unless uh, there was leadership on the municipal level. We had a, we had no, no town planner, but we did have a very strong town administrator. Uh, and we had a group that was appointed of three uh, strong individuals in the community with economic development background. The town chose to bring in outside counsel to support them. They chose to bring in a professional planning firm to support them. And interestingly, in this case, um, they also brought in a developer, uh, or a, a guy named Dick Reynolds, who some of you may know, who's been in the development business for a long time, to make sure that the town was reflecting you know, economic reality in terms of their negotiations. So having a smaller and professional group to sit and strategize and negotiate with uh, was very important. Great, thank you. We'll come, <clears throat> come back to each of you. Uh, so Matt, uh, you're batting clean up here. I'm used to it with uh, Zoller as my last name. So that's right. That's fitting. Right. <laughs> um, but thank you, Bob. Yes, that's true. So and, uh, please yeah. talk about Brockton and anything else you want to talk about. Talk about <laughs> the Red Sox. That's right. That's a good topic. Um, <laughs> thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the Boston Foundation and NIOP for hosting us, and uh, DHCD and uh, Bill, his good work. Uh, he assisted us through the process. Uh, couldn't have done it without some guidance here. Um, and Ted as well. Um, and Representative Honan, your work continues to help all of us in the housing community. Um, so quickly, uh, Trinity Financial, we're an urban uh, mixed-use infill developer. Uh, I've done about $2 billion worth of development across uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, and New York. Um, so the, this project was kind of, um, it, was, it was a first for Trinity, it was our first 40R, uh, in that you know, we, and similarly, like me coming to the the, that last year, we were the last in on this project. It had a long history um, in the city. Another developer had tried to make the project work, and um, they were unsuccessful. So we came in and had a new concept and a new view on the project. So I think that was instrumental in getting the, the project um, to where it needed to be, ultimately, uh, into construction. Um, a little background on the project. It was a complicated um, uh, a mixed use transaction. Uh, it's right in the center of downtown. You can't get any more downtown at Center and Main Street, um, Montello and Petronelli Way, a full city block, 3.4 acres. Um, we're right next to the commuter rail stop, which couldn't be any more 40R in itself there. Um, and it, it's, um, it's a mix of uh, residential and commercial uses. Uh, we permitted um, a multi-phase project. It's uh, 215 units. Uh, the first phase, which is currently under construction, is 113 units. And there's also um, 55,000 square feet of office space. It's a rehab, a historic rehab, right on Main Street. Um, and so all of those things come, came together to create you know, what we had as our, our project. Um, and as I said, it was kind of over time that the project evolved um, and became what we ultimately built, or are building currently now, um, in that uh, the city had a tool uh, for large-scale development, and they hadn't done some for quite a long time. Um, as many of you know, uh, Brockton um, 
like many of the gateway cities, uh, was successful at one point in time. And then there was uh, urban renewal took place, and a lot of the businesses moved out. So this was a reinvestment in the downtown. Um, so the 40R was helpful in that respect. Um, what it did was it set the framework for us to come into the city with a plan. Uh, and then the, the, while they had a small planning department, they were able to kind of vet the project um, quickly and get us where we needed to be. Um, and, and that is closed and under construction. So um, now we're, we're under construction, the first phase of development. It's, uh, as I said, 113 units. Um, it's really great that we have an artist live work component to this project. So 42 of the units are um, designated with an artist preference. Um, and that was something that the city liked to see and it fit in well with the 40R um, because there is an arts and cultural district in the larger context of the 40R in downtown Brockton because there's multiple districts uh, similar to you know, what Lisa showed you, uh, multiple projects happening at once. Um, so again, it gave the city the tools to be able to review the project quickly. Um, we started um, in April of 2011 and we finished uh, city review three months later. So for large scale projects such as ours, that was pretty quick. And um, they, you know, the planning board, we had three planning board meetings, I believe, and they understood what we were trying to do and uh, it made sense to them and it gave back to the city and it's ultimately going to revitalize the downtown and that's, that's what they wanted to see. Um, I should also mention that we had to change the program a little bit um, in that um, we had to take down a historic building that we had hoped to rehab and save and we went back to the city for, re, for that reapproval, uh, change to the report and decision, and that only took one meeting, two weeks. So um, it was really a great tool for the city to be able to um, you know, quickly understand the project and then um, get us through the process and ultimately under construction. So uh, we're, again, we're in the first phase now, it's 55,000 square feet of office, 113 units. And then we have a subsequent phase of 102 units and a parking garage. Um, so um, when we complete this in about a year, uh, we'll look to start that project. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so I had a few other uh, questions to throw out to the panel, and then we'll uh, turn it over to the, to the audience to be more interactive. Um, on the projects that are, the 40 Rs that are sort of initiated by the developer, um, do, you, do any of you have a sense of whether there's a certain minimum size project that you need to justify and affect the upfront expense of going through negotiating the rezoning, the design standards? Because at least our experience, and I know this is why the program was organized the way it is and structured the way it is, basically you're spending more money upfront negotiating what the zoning will be, what the design standards will be, and getting that town meeting vote, because once the project becomes as of right, the town basically loses some of its leverage that it would later have in a special permit process. So you negotiate, whatever negotiation is going to occur about the project, whether that's mitigation, community benefits, whatever it is, happens up front, and you front end those, uh, those components of a development project in exchange, in effect, for more certainty later, that you, you are as of right, it's harder to get appealed, it's basically almost as of right site plan review as long as you meet the design standards. So do you have a sense of whether a project needs to be a certain size to go through that upfront process? Can speak to that? Okay. Yeah. Let's start I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> big. Um, you could tell they were not big. prepped on this bigger. question. Bigger no, is big, bigger, bigger is better. And yeah. I think if you, if, if you think about what the intent is, it's a Haverhill type project where you're not necessarily putting in a project, but you're putting in an area. Right. And that's, much, that, that's really a much more effective approach to doing it. There is some critical mass, and it's a, it's a, it's a cost-benefit decision going in. A lot of that depends upon the town as well as the developer. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think some kind of mass is critical. You never know whether it's one meeting or whether it's five years. Right. And uh, it, uh, you know, we, we clearly have seen projects take more than five years. Um, so. I, I think the only other, Bob, I, I think that's right. Speak up a little bit, Lisa. Sure. I think that's right, Ted. And um, I mean, when I think about what you did in Linfield, where you had a couple of hundred, you had a golf course, so you could kind of create enough 200 mass. Acres. 200 acres. 
you could create enough mass and you know, scale to make it worthwhile. So that's a significant um, asset that you have to spend some time negotiating around. I think it, and the other example is, as he mentioned in Haverhill, it's a district. So even though our, one, that one development was, ours was 57 units, the next one for cities was 300 and something units. Um, but you, you know, there's enough uh, scale altogether, I think, certainly, to make it worthwhile. I, I do think, though, that it's not, I, our personal experience, because projects can take longer than five years, and some of ours have, when you look at still that cost of negotiating the 40R elements versus um, going through the process in a challenging 40B, um, you know, you're at least in a productive path when you're spending that money. So um, I, I'm not sure that it's that much greater than you are otherwise investing with, that, with less certainty. Elisa, when you did the 57 units, were you the primary negotiator on the 40R, or was it, um, was it more of a wider effort? It was a wider effort, for sure. And there was a lot more municipal involvement. You know, it, was, it did come more from the city. To try to facilitate the To try to facilitate, the facilitate development. that, yeah. right. Right. Um, I will say we did uh, seek a waiver from the unit numbers that were allotted under the 40R. You know, we had a 3.4-acre uh, site. We were roughly allowed 70 units, and we, we put in for 113. So that took a little back and forth with the city, but ultimately they saw that the scale of the project, you know, um, it would, is what needed to be done on that site to be successful there. And so 113 units in the first phase, 102 in the second, so that critical mass was key. Uh, and it's, you know, an urban area, you want density there. So, and they got that, and the 40R helped. My recollection, several of you have touched upon it, is, and I do remember in the early days of the Linfield project, there were either some pending or threatened 40Bs elsewhere in town that, that the town did not want. Right. And they saw 40R as an alternative where they could get housing where they did want it, which yeah. I know is... I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, we, we see, and Representative Honan mentioned, you know, in so many different communities, the, the attempt to legislate out children. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, that's not today's topic, but, but it, it is that th th there are communities who, in a very responsible way, try to manage where their 40B or where their affordable housing right. will be, how much it will be. And, and, and there are those communities who try to get to their 10% uh, number. And uh, so it can be a very responsible management tool for those communities to, to control where, when, and how those uh, units are built. So uh, one or the other of you touched on the, co the topic of development agreements that often get negotiated in the 40B, pardon me, 40R process. Um, um, how many of you on your projects have separate development agreements with the communities where your projects are located, or in your case, Adam, where they've been negotiated for a municipality as, I, I won't say an inducement to the adoption of the district as much as addressing things that cannot be addressed in zoning but nevertheless need to be addressed, whether it's infrastructure mitigation. Just out of curiosity, how many projects have you worked on that have development agreements that came p as part of the rezoning? Well, I can say uh, from my experience in representing municipalities that certainly the substantial majority of uh, municipal projects, whether they be uh, developer-driven projects that were brought before a municipality or projects that were pursued uh, on the municipality's own initiative, uh, have had development agreements. Uh, those development agreements have covered all sorts of uh, subjects, but the obvious ones would be things like infrastructure improvements. I can think back to the uh, the, the Northampton uh, Hospital Hill 40R overlay district and the development agreement addressed uh, the need for sidewalks in the vicinity of the uh, proposed district and it addressed the extension of a, a bike path in the vicinity of the proposed district. So those were items that were negotiated uh, through that process. And similarly in other communities, uh, Sharon Commons is another example uh, that was again a residential project. Uh, but there were some concerns with respect to the infrastructure in the surrounding area. Um, and so there, were, there was a negotiation that was undertaken simultaneously with the 40R process and a development agreement was ultimately signed that provided the, the uh, town with a sense of surety that its concerns were going to be addressed and at the same time allowed for adoption of the 40R district with some design standards that um, provided the, the same sense of surety or security to the, the developer that he or she it could pursue development, could do so expeditiously um, with all the benefits of 40R. 
Can I ask a question, Adam? So sure. on the other side of the coin in the development agreements, what do you typically see the towns committing to as part of that agreement? Well, the obvious one would be the adoption of the zoning, and that's a, a, a real big incentive to, to Which the, is hard to do in a development agreement, right? Because that's all generally a town meeting. It action. is, and so generally it's a contingency that the obviously anything, uh, any commitments which are made by the proposed developer in the development agreement would be contingent upon a town meeting vote. If that town meeting vote doesn't happen, if the district is never adopted, then the, the, the development agreement is all but moot. Um, beyond that, there haven't been many other um, uh, uh, municipal concessions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it's been on the part of the developer, I think, because developers recognize that um, it's a front-loaded process, that they would be pr probably providing those same mitigation packages through a traditional special permit process, through a 40B review. Um, they're doing it up front in the form of a development agreement under 40R with the understanding that they're going to only be required to go through a plan approval process that is akin to a, a site plan review and probably won't have, certainly doesn't have the same teeth that site plan approval would have and isn't going to have the, the same number of conditions. What about uh, similarly the issue of design standards? What have been your experiences uh, either in developing the design standards on the municipal side or on the developer side working with a municipality to fashion them incident to the adoption of, of 40R? Ted, you, you commented a few minutes ago that because of changing needs, maybe some things might be different if they were adopted today versus earlier, there is obviously the waiver power that several of you have mm -hmm. commented upon, but maybe first from the municipal perspective, how are the design standards developed? Have there been resources internal to the municipality? Have you gone out to outside consultants and are there particular lessons that maybe have been learned over time about the need for flexibility or more flexibility? Sure. I think the answer is both. Uh, we've had municipalities that have had sufficient resources in-house that they've been able to craft design standards or alternatively where the project is developer driven to review proposed design standards that are put forth by the developer. Uh, that's not the case in every municipality. We already heard about a municipality that didn't have a town planner. Uh, we work in municipalities that just simply don't have the staff in-house. So in some of those municipalities they've sought outside assistance. Um, typically the developer, the proponent of the project, uh, would provide some funding to the municipality to be placed in escrow to uh, fund the services of, of that consultant to create design standards. Uh, I would say probably in the majority of, of the 40R proposals that, in which we've been involved, the design standards have been crafted by the developer, uh, proposed to the municipality, and there's been some, some level of internal review. Uh, there's also a legal aspect to the review of those design standards, and that becomes a bit of a, a negotiation or uh, a discussion point with DHCD to be sure that those design standards are objective enough to not give the plan approval authority the ability to deny what's supposed to be an as-of-right project. Yeah, we, we benefited yeah. from design standards. Actually, the city of Brockton had a 43D study uh, completed, and along with that came some of these design standards. And, um, you know, as we were going through the process and designing the project, there were some things that we needed to seek waivers on, but having that there as a tool was key. Um, you know, just from an educational standpoint, uh, to, to kind of tell the city how they might go about this project connecting to the rest of the, ta the city and other projects that would come along, that's a challenge. So having those in place was really helpful for the project. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I do think, though, that something that Adam said is, is also really correct, that it depends upon the local expertise and um, whether or not they have folks on staff who can put those together. I also think that something that Ted said is most critical, the comment about flexibility, because things do change. We had just had an interesting experience with the mayor of Haverhill, who's been fabulous with, um, in working with us on our last development and the one coming up. And we were talking about design standards for the new district, the, our new development there. And he had some kind of interesting ideas, sort of funky ideas. And, um, and then he wanted to put together a group. And then kind of design happens by committee. And then you're all over the place. And it, it was not, I said, well, let us show you something. Why don't we show you something? See what, you know, see what we have in mind. Because uh, that next development will set the standard. And he, he wants it to set the design standard for that district, for that whole area. Um, but the, the, you know, the initial thought process about how those might be put together was a little scary. Um, and thankfully, you know, he said, great, and I, I think Adam did comment on the fact that a lot of times the design standards are brought forth by the developer, and they have a professional team, and there is, 
you know, they study what that area, what might make sense for the area. So I think that, you know, in cases where the developer can be proactive and the city and uh, the municipality welcomes that, and there's flexibility built into it all over the place is probably you know, one of the better outcomes. I always say the uh, horse designed by committee ends up being the camel, right? It, yeah. And it, it happens. <laughs> It happens quite often. Right. Um, you know, one of the, the things that's key, we, so it, it, a lot on the design standard just depends on the complexity of the project, right? Mm -hmm. In Reading, fairly simple, and the concern was height, dimensional, um, materials, and not much else. That, that, that's pretty easy. When you start mixing uses, it becomes more complex. And you know, we right. have 17 individual buildings of various mm -hmm. use types in Linfield and that required a pretty complex design standard. Yeah. But one of the important distinctions in the design standard is the difference between sort of aspirational and required. Hmm. And mm -hmm. we have a lot in the design standards that is aspirational, mm -hmm. which leaves it open for some interpretation, which is good, good um, with certain things that are more important being requirements. The other thing is how are they administered over time? And uh, as we, have develop buildings over a really a seven year period, um, the town has employed its own outside consultant. What that has done, which is very positive, is that it has not put the design review in the hands of a planning board, yes. which has completely changed over in the period of time right. that's been involved with the project. It's put it in the hands of an outside consultant who has a design standard in front of him and has his his our plans next to it and can compare the both yeah, yeah. and if there's anything that requires you know waiver or interpretation then it goes back to the planning board so it it takes the political process and puts it aside which is great mm -hmm. i was also thinking that as we all know every municipality is different and has its own quirky issues and i don't recall whether it was linfield or reading but i seem to recall in one of the design standards it was, as you said, Ted, some things are aspirational, some things are required, and then there were certain things that were so important to the town that they said the planning board could not waive, could huh. not waive certain items. Right. And, the, and I don't remember which town it was, but it was the culture saying, we don't trust the planning board. Yeah. So there were certain things we're going to build right into the legislation. You have to go right back to town meeting. Into the zone. It would have to go back to town. I don't remember what the topics were, but there's some certain mm -hmm. topics that would have to go back to town meeting. Be, just because of the, in the culture of whatever that municipality was, there was a, a level of, that, that comes back, we're not going to delegate that even to one of our planning board or, or the legislative, or the, uh, something other than the, the legislative body. True. Interesting. Um, I was also thinking of Ted talking earlier and others about uh, 40R being one tool in the, in, the, in the arsenal, if you will. And my memory of RIT, what became Reading Gateway, which national, uh, got adopted but did not build. It was ultimately sold to Pulte Homes. And I think there's some folks from Pulte, I, I know I saw on the registration list, who actually have built the project that Bill showed you. Um, my, but my memory there was the, it was only part of the area. So part of the area that was owned was turned into the 40 r district. And one reason for that was that it enabled, as I recall, greater height, closer to Route 128, and more density on that part of the parcel and from a legal standpoint, I think, Adam, you made this point, that by it being in the zoning as of right, uh, you don't need a variance. And you're not open to a challenge of spot zoning. So if you need a variance and you get one and it gets appealed and it goes, it actually gets tried, you know, 99 times out of 100, you're going to lose. So you don't try to premise a project on a variance. And so having the organic legislation, the actual statute, the zoning allow whatever it is, whatever the dimensional requirement is, is a very effective tool from a sort of strategic standpoint of planning a project up front. And um, so I think to your point. So why don't I just give the five minute warning or maybe even the three minute warning. Think of your questions. We're gonna to go to the audience after one or two more. Um, and Bill, can you, can we mic get a mic for Bill up front? I want, we had a question for Bill, which he covered briefly in his slides. He can just talk loudly. We have a small enough room. Which is uh, this uh, sort of the catch-all category of other suitable locations, uh, whatever the precise statutory term is. The How highly suitable highly locations. Highly suitable locations. Yes. Yeah. The, sort of the basket clause, if you will. Yep. 
Want to address um, that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we basically look at that as, you know, other smart growth locations that don't happen to fit into the first two categories, um, places with infrastructure, places where uh, there's redevelopment potential. Um, we did, uh, you know, to, you know, I guess to the dismay of some probably in this room, tweak that regulation language a little bit. We decided that there was something that just the mere fact that it was in a local plan uh, alone uh, shouldn't necessarily, uh, uh, you know, determine whether it's a smart growth location uh, in a local plan as a as a place for a higher density housing. So we wanted a little a little more flexibility on that. Um, but uh, we've had, I mean, if you look at the chart that uh, was on your seat, you can see that there's uh, plenty of uh, highly suitable locations. So we haven't we haven't been, uh, you know. Uh, really too, uh, you know, uh, choosy with those or, or uh, held off on that. I mean, I think there are plenty of, uh, as you can see from some of the slides, the Northampton slide, uh, I mean, the, the amusement park in, in Dartmouth, I mean, those are the kinds of locations that sort of uh, fit that description, I think. Yeah, and to the people who were involved in the drafting, I would just say as, as, as one lawyer, that was extremely good forethought. You always throw in a basket, catch-all clause for some, <laughs> yes. for some flexibility. Uh, while we have Bill just standing, and we were talking about this earlier, so, uh, and people have touched upon it, and those who haven't worked with the statute, the uh, zoning gets adopted as of right, and then you basically get site plan review for your the more detailed plans of the project, and as Ted said, you try to make it as cookbook as possible. If there are 10 design standards, you go, you check them off, you're entitled to your approval. It rings a lot of the discretion out of what is often the special permit process where you don't have 40R. Um, and then the appeal period, appeal provision basically says that unlike 40A, traditional zoning, if there's an appeal, the appeal is not heard what's called de novo. The case is not heard anew by the court. It's a review of the record of the planning board decision. So it's a more limited standard for judicial review, uh, m much more deference to what the planning board or the local plan authority has done. Much, it's basically harder to attack on appeal. And to Adam's point, you also have to post a bond uh, if you're a plaintiff. So it really makes people think twice about bringing frivolous appeals purely for delay, because we all know delay kills projects. So I'd asked Ted, um, I'm sorry, Bill, earlier whether DHCD had any records of uh, whether there have been appeals, whether that provision did what its drafts people intended it to do. And I think you told, we talked some about 40 hours that weren't adopted on the front end by town meeting or city council, but well, we, do we know of any, well, why don't you talk about yeah, appeals I generally? Mean, there are two cases where there, that I'm aware of that uh, there's been litigation. Um, that is the Kingston 40R district and the Natick uh, paperboard 40R. Um, I, you know, my understanding in the, in the case of Kingston, there was a, you know, deep pocketed butter who uh, actually, rather than challenging, the, I think the planning board decision, I mean, I think he threw a bunch of stuff out there, but one of them was challenging the zoning adoption, the town zoning adoption. And there was, uh, you know, a change in the, I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the rare species uh, map had changed since the time that they submitted their 40R application and the time that uh, uh, that the town adopted the 40R and the developer uh, used that to uh, to uh, you know um, litigate and uh, you know I'm not aware of all the different angles that the the abutter took but that was one case uh, the other so in that way they sort of found a way around. Uh, Unfortunately, that uh, that provision. Um, the other one is the, the Natick paperboard site. Uh, I'm not as familiar with that, um, and whether they, uh, whether the provision, the, the, the bonding provision, was really, um, uh, you know, from, from from my understanding, from talking to the developer, he said that uh, the the uh, judge hadn't really put a lot of <laughs> uh, a weight in that. In fact, I think maybe the uh, the developer, oh, who was an abutting you know, real estate owner, wanted to develop their property. Uh, I, my understanding is that he actually challenged, one of the things he challenged was that provision. <laughs> so um, those, okay. are, those are the two that I'm aware of. Well, thank you. So why don't we go to the audience? The folks have mics out there. Why don't you put your hand up and wait for the mic to come to you before you 
who has the mics around? Why don't you just pick some? Oh, okay. Why don't you, David's always the first question. He's always has questions <laughs> ready. Thank you. David Begalfa from NAOF. Thank you. Um, I have an odd question, but I think it's an appropriate one. There are over 10,000 units that have already been approved, zoning has been approved for the 40R, and that haven't been built. Um, and they've been around for quite a while. So if you could give advice to the city officials as far as saying, you have those, you, you, you did everything you want, you're really trying to encourage this, what more do you think they need to do at this stage to make these attractive for development? Um, what, is not, what has not been done that you think needs to be done that will put these units a little bit ahead of the curve as far as being viable sites for development? So I, I, um, I think part of it's marketing. I think that part of it is the developers aren't aware of what's out there and what the opportunity is. And I have to say, again, using Haverhill as an example, they did a terrific job. They have a, a, a website called HaverhillMeansBusiness.com. I think it still is up. They held the developers conference. They, just as I think um, Bill said, he's got cut sheets on properties here today. They had cut sheets on properties that were available. Um, you could go to, the, go to the website and get all the information you needed about the demographics, the economics of the area, the resident population, the building itself. I could sit in the, I did, sit in my office in Boston and with a measuring tool, by measuring the roof of different buildings, I could tell how many units, you know, you know the, how the building's roughly laid out, how many units it would fit there, and you know, it'd say 20 units, no, 200 maybe, we'll look at that. So they really did a lot of marketing, and at the same time, they were very proactive in coming forward with how they would help bring the department heads together. Um, you know, I think the district itself, frankly, didn't have a ton to sell it because it was disinvested. It was not the kind of, it wasn't necessarily the development area that you would be attracted to, but they had, they did some very proactive marketing campaigns. It's one thought. I'd, I'd add two things to what Lisa said. Uh, one is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that the municipalities can get a head start on infrastructure and have sites that are ready and available, that's helpful. Second is just uh, defining the permitting process and making it as expedited and as simple as, pro as, as possible. With that and some marketing, if there's economic opportunity and there's financing uh, that's available, developers ought to find it. And I would add to, I agree with both those things, but then I would add that you know, uh, the proper staff, making them available from a city standpoint, you know, for questions and identifying those folks and getting them out there, um, that's helpful too. Okay, to put up your hand, Eleanor in front, Eleanor White. Um, this was touched on, but I just want to make it explicit. the uh, The relationship between 40B and 40R has always been uh, complicated, but 40R requires 20% affordability. Many communities in their applications have required 25% affordability in rental projects so that they can count all of the units in the project toward their uh, subsidized housing inventory. And that's a big selling point with a lot of cities and towns mm -hmm. who have not reached their 10%. Bob, could I just make one other comment about 40R and 40B since we're on them? I just I sort of can't go through this without saying I do think we have, we, you need both. You need 40B and 40R, and 40B is more of a sort of stick, 40R is more of a carrot or an incentive, but in part, the 40B, the fact that 40B exists is what has gotten a lot of municipalities to create 40R districts. And, you know, and Ted said, we don't know if picking where you want to put the housing is good or bad, but I do think that it's not a substitute, and we have to keep fighting and working as hard as, uh, thankfully, Representative Honan does to maintain 40B as a, as a critical tool as well. But I, I think 40R would not be as successful if it weren't, if 40B didn't exist. So you do need both. I should agree with that. Why don't we go to the back, the folks in, way in the back? Is there a mic, mic back there? Just, uh, Thank you. Uh, you stand up? That, that Bob Sure, back Bob there? Russo, Holland and Knight. Um, my question relates to 40S. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not aware, I think I'm only aware of one or two that Ted has told me about where 40S has been implicated. Is yeah. there a reason yeah. for that? Is there a lack of availability or is it just not needed or is it, what's the story? I, most of us don't know a lot about education finance. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, there are three communities that have applied. Uh, well, I should step back there. Out of the you know, 33 districts, you can see from your chart, uh, 19 or so have had production out of those uh, only three communities have actually applied for the 40S funding. 
Um, two of them have been funded. Chelsea was funded for a couple of years. Uh, Lakeville, I believe, is uh, in their fourth year of, of payments. Uh, so uh, there is money. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's not sitting there. That's part of the problem. Um, so, uh, but I don't think that explains all the lack of, uh, of interest, I guess, in pursuing and simply applying for the funding. I think, you know, just anecdotally, I've spoken to some uh, uh, town planners in, in 40R communities, and they just sort of intuitively understand that they, uh, they didn't have a net increase in school costs because of mm -hmm. the revenue that they were getting from the project, basically, um, and, the, and the composition of, of, of the project itself in terms of the units. Um, so that's, that's what I've, I've heard. Okay, some more folks in the back. Just uh, grab the mic, speak up, say, identify yourself. I'm Barry Bluestone. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's oh, be Barry. a little clearer about 40S. Um, the reason why we, Ted and Eleanor and I built 40S was that when we first had 40R, we had very few communities that were taking advantage of it for the presumed reason that they were fearful that they'd be successful projects and young people would move in with their kids and the kids would go to their schools and bust their school budget. Uh, whenever you fear something happening in your life, you try and get insurance. And so 40S is an insurance program. Uh, and of course, insurance agents would like to be able to spend as much, as little as possible. And in fact, we did a study of how many communities and how many projects would probably end up being eligible 40S. It was a very small number. Uh, but that there are any at all that might made it reasonable to have this legislation so that it would be one other argument that we wouldn't have to worry about in terms of development. And it has been quite successful because after 40S, we had many, many more towns and cities coming forward because they had that insurance if indeed uh, the school costs would, would be higher than expected. So if I can ask a question while you're passing the mic, it's, this is not intended to be a bomb thrower question, but it might come out that way. So to our developer panelists, if the communities would allow you, allow you to have more three-bedroom units, can you, can you sell or rent them? Because that's uh, often in our experience, the communities say, well, approve 40R, but we want to limit the number of three-bedroom units. Yeah, it, it depends on the community. Uh, it really does. I mean, uh, we've, and Linfield was an example of a community that did want to restrict the number of three-bedroom units, and it happens a lot. Um, you deal with other places, to throw a bouquet to Newton as an example, where Newton actually encourages uh, creating family housing, as does Boston. So um, it depends a little bit on the community and it depends on the market within the community. Our, our business changes frequently and you know, in our more urban projects, roommate apartments are in vogue and then they're out of vogue and everybody is looking at micro units or smaller studio units or smaller one bedrooms. So it, 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 uh, you, you like to have, it's, it, it's not a bomb, you like to have the flexibility of being able to build it when the market uh, dictates it and the community wants to do it. Okay, back. Folks standing in the back. Hey, thanks, um, Greg Sampson. I just had a question. A lot of the communities I've seen have adopted, uh, the bylaw or ordinance they've adopted is almost mimics verbatim the template created by DHCD. And I was wondering, similarly, after 10 years of experience and the need to update the, regula uh, the regulations, if there's been any thought about updating the template uh, ordinance because there's probably some additional flexibility or uh, mixture of uses that could be done in that template that then communities could adopt for the benefit of encouraging the 40 r adoption. Bill? Uh, you know, I, we haven't, uh, I don't think, approved one district that's, uh, you know, followed that template template exactly and I don't I can't think of actually two districts that probably have the exact same zoning so it's always a process a sort of iterative process of them using that as a point of departure um, or you know in the case of Norwood uh, using the the first one they adopted to sort of uh, def, you know uh, begin with in terms of crafting an, a second district um, so there's a, a room for a lot of flexibility I mean certainly it's it's probably time to look at it one thing we've talked about is Boston, I think, took a very unique approach in their 40R zoning, 
which was to put all the required elements that are standard to every 40R and stuff that's regulatory and that uh, are statutory in one article and then to put the stuff that's unique to a particular di district that you might create in your community uh, in a separate article. Um, and we've, uh, I tried to, <laughs> to encourage one community to sort of take that approach and it'll, it backfired on me a little bit um, up in Beverly, but, uh, but that's something we've talked about is trying to um, you know, tweak that a little bit for uh, sort of a non-Boston community. But happy to, happy to you know, entertain that conversation and have help in, in doing that. <laughs> okay, why don't we take a few more questions? Who has the mic? Who's, who's wandering with the mic? Let's ask uh, Angus Jennings here. I was reflecting actually as she's passing this that I've worked on and my office worked on 340Rs, another one was Cordage Park, and Angus was the planner for the town in each one, and it's obviously driven him to run for public office. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how the other state representatives feel about that, but. I appreciate it. Drove that. you over the edge, right? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I appreciate <laughs> the uh, comment that Representative Honan made, and uh, while we did make a lot of uh, uh, progress in Marshfield on housing in a, in a town that had not done anything previously. We were starting from zero, and it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and part of it is trying to, try to align the interests of the community with the interests of the Commonwealth in getting the amount of housing bill. And my question uh, is, you know, I think there's been a lot of good work done, there's no question, but when you look at the amount of housing that's going to be needed uh, in the next 10 or 20 years and, and the, the terrific work that's been done uh, with, uh, with Barry's office and MAPC supported by the Boston Foundation, the need is very real. And I can tell you from my uh, consulting work with towns, it, you know, it, it amazes me that every time you go into a new community, they're very often at the beginning of the learning curve. And they, they just don't get uh, the need for housing and the demographic trends and, and just the, the amount of housing that's, that's going to be needed. So when I look at the list of what's been done, my biggest concern is that uh, the total acreage that's been zoned is just over 1,400 acres. And to get the volume of housing built uh, that's going to be needed, we need towns to, to look more at district scale zones like Brockton and Haverhill have done, but which have been very uh, difficult to do in the more suburban locations. And I think there, there are a couple of thoughts I have on things that could change that, and I'd, I'd be interested in uh, thoughts from uh, the panel. The first is there's a political disincentive in a town meeting form of government uh, to have a very high uh, future zoned unit count. Uh, because even though anyone who's worked in real estate or, or in professional planning, you know just because the zoning may allow 2,000 units, that doesn't mean there's market support and that you're going to get 2,000 units next year. But the typical town meeting voter will think that that's what's going to happen and they won't support it. So that creates a political incentive at the local level through the 40-hour process to make the zoning district as small as possible to really make that future zoned units as small as possible and as politically palatable as possible. And I think that's part of why we've seen, in some cases, kind of micro zoning where, in fact, district scale zoning may have made more sense. Uh, so I wonder if the department would consider for larger districts, once you've hit that 600, which is really the threshold for the uh, uh, or it's actually 501 units and above. Once you've zoned for that number of units, you're, you're qualified for the $600,000 payment. Uh, so I wonder if the department would consider not asking the community to do the full calculation. That way you can say to town meeting, look, it's more than 500 units. You're going to get 600,000, but not put the community in the position of having to say, oh, it might be 1,500 units or 2,000 units, uh, when, when politically it's going to be next to impossible to get that vote through town meeting. Uh, so that's one you know, minor suggestion. And the other one, which is more significant, is whether the panel feels if there was a more direct relationship between 40R and 40B, such that if a community zoned enough area under 40R as of right density, that there would be, uh, if not total protection, because you need some you know, I, I think production needs to be part of how the state evaluates the town's progress with 40B. But right now, it's the only uh, measure. And so a town could do uh, significant district-scale rezoning under 40R and still be subject to 40B anywhere else in town until the production actually arrives. And, uh, you know, if in the next 10 years, if we're going to see districts that are 
larger geographically and larger in, ter in terms of creating the scale of investment opportunity that's going to be needed to build the amount of housing we need. Um, I've, I feel like some direct link between 40R and 40B could be a very powerful motivator for towns to look at more district scale uh, zoning. So, thanks. Okay, well, let's see. There are a couple of different questions there. So maybe taking the second question first, maybe Lisa, since you've talked a lot about doing yeah. both 40Bs and 40Rs, do you have a, a view uh, of Anchorage's right. suggestion? I, I think it's an interesting idea, and um, it would be interesting to hear DHDs and the administration's thoughts on that as well. But my one, my, one of my worries about um, identifying this as zoning a certain amount of uh, land as 40R district could give you relief under 40B. As I think we've just heard and, and we've seen, you can create the districts and not have the units built. Um, I, I, and I think we have to not, d you know, head in a path or a direction that could take the uh, sort of pressure off of communities to get a certain number of units for, for you know, to meet the affordability requirements and needs. So. It's an interesting idea, but I think it's might maybe focused in a little bit of a, a way that doesn't get the outcome that we want for the units built. Um, in fact, it might feel like a kind of easy way to get to do neither. Um, so you can make a 40R so restrictive and difficult that it's that's not much fun to develop in either. So I, I think it's an interesting idea. I would I would you know want to um, have people look closely at that. I, I did I would say on the general question of of great need, um, and clearly we're not um, developing or building at a pace that's going to meet it yet. I think this administration, you know, has been quite unusual in their commitment to it. You know, Arthur Jameson was here earlier. He left. Larry is here, obviously. Bill over there trying to figure out how to answer the first part of the question. Um, <laughs> but, but they're, they're having a but, consultation oh, here to here. answer your question, Angus. Just depends to get a call. But I, but I do think that the leadership in the administration has had a lot to do with, I mean, creating a goal as bold as 10,000 units a year is pretty unusual, and I, I sure hope that whomever is the next governor is going to stick to that commitment and be as bold and put, you know, encourage these kinds of tools, create the support in, you know, um, uh, the growth initiatives that this administration has, and again, Arthur and Larry do this all day long. So I, I do think that, you know, they're tackling it hard, and we haven't yet, as development, the development community and the municipalities, I think, haven't kept up with the leadership in the administration, and we need to get a little more aggressive and assertive about it. But I'm going to take a shot at that, and then we'll close it down, I think, and sure. let. Well, uh, um, I just Rachel. wanted to note that uh, on one point, Angus. Uh, that in addition to Reading, where a site eligibility letter was denied um, because, in part, they had two districts that were being implemented, there was also Easton, uh, another one where uh, there was a 40B eligibility, eligibility letter denied. Um, and I don't believe any units had been constructed yet. Um, and it wasn't you know, solely because of Easton's Quisit Commons 40R district. Also, you know, they were uh, the town had really put a lot of time and money into uh, the shovel shop redevelopment. So it's a, it's a, I think it's an overall picture, um, you know, and I think that uh, I, I'm happy to, you know, take that back to the office and, and run it up the flagpole, but I, I think um, my guess is that, uh, um, well, I don't know, but it's, I, I think context is, is sometimes important. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the, uh, the other issue. Um, Oh, something about six, the 600, 500 units. Oh, oh yeah, units. sorry. The, uh, uh, well, Larry and I were just kind of huddling on that, and uh, we're not sure that that, is, uh, that would statutorily uh, be, be okay. Um, but again, um, willing to take that back to the office and, and, uh, and, and discuss it. And Great, thank good you. questions. I want to thank the panel for, uh, and Bill and everyone from BHCD. Give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, thank all of our panelists for just a terrifically informative discussion about how you've used 40R and the issues and the needs you've encountered. So please join me in uh, acknowledging them again, but acknowledging all of our speakers, Bill, <laughs> Representative, <laughs> and and also um, my co-sponsor, uh, David Bigelfer, and I've just got a few more comments, but David, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we've all heard the progress at this 10-year uh, uh, inflection point uh, for 40R, and Representative Honan is right. Uh, we should and need to celebrate this wonderful um, event. We have gotten a lot done. 
Um, and uh, this smart growth housing is housing that we desperately needed. Um, and it's ter terrific that it's happened. We need to recruit and retain uh, workers uh, for our economy. And we, we really do need to continue to deal with this issue of middle income strata uh, worker housing that's so crucial to our economic competitiveness here. Um, but there's much, uh, so much current new opportunity. I just want to remind us um, to build as of right in this array of desirable locations that continue to exist throughout the Commonwealth, um, and to zone new districts and communities that are ripe for this kind of approach. I hope um, this will give you all a renewed uh, interest and impetus to join us in doing that. And I hope it's also a recommit of all of us to maintaining the kind of funding uh, that we need to have from the legislature and to continue the Smart Growth Housing Trust Fund. So um, with all that, I thank you once again, and I hope you see you again soon.